for us are certainly people, market and product. We look for perseverance. 99% of the value is in the execution, so, so the investment comes really into the team that's actually able to execute. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you at this point. Welcome back to Entrepreneurship 101 and our 360 panel on venture capital funding, moderated by Barry Jakir, who is the or managing director for the Mars Investment Accelerator Fund. Before, we, before I introduce Barry, we do have a few announcements. And a special shout out and welcome to our webcast participants from NORCAT, Innovation Factory, and Hal Haltech. Always a pleasure to have you here. Our Entrepreneurship 101 certificates, uh, for those of you who know how important the attendance is, um, we do, it's, if you would like to have, get a certificate from us, uh, please put your request in before pers in person before the lecture, before next week's lecture, which is our final lecture, um, or do so by email. And this includes not just live attendance, but webcast attendance as well. So if you've attended 60% of the lectures, that's 20 out of the 30, then you do qualify for a certificate. Our Future Leaders Boot Camps is for high school students ages 13 to 18. We do have two cohorts, 13 to 15 and 16 to 18. It runs July 21st to 25th, and we're really excited. Um, it's five very intense days of basically test driving entrepreneurship, um, and they have a lot of fun. They are, um, they're, they have access to the entrepreneurs that are in the space, and they go out and do basically everything that an entrepreneur would do in the space of, well, not everything, but uh, they do, they do, it's a pretty intense session. So we're looking forward to that. The early bird deadline has been extended to the 5th of May, that's next week, Monday, and that takes about $50 off the, off the registration fee. So we're looking, we are looking forward to um, having about 40 students in the room, in the space. Um, and if you have children or know people who have children who might be interested in the event, uh, please invite them to, to register and to participate. So Barry Jakir is the managing, managing director for the Mars Investment Accelerator Fund, or the IAF. Um, and the Investment Accelerator Fund is a seed stage fund that invests up to $500,000 to help early stage Ontario technology companies bring their products and services to market. The IAF has invested in over 80 companies since its inception in 2007. Barry has over 25 years of experience in senior management positions in venture capital, private equity, and operating companies. Prior to joining Mars, Barry was a partner at Venture West, one of Canada's largest venture capital firms. During his 13 years at Venture West, Barry worked closely with entrepreneurs while making early stage technology investments in IT, communications, clean tech, and medical device companies. Barry has served on the board of the Canadian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association and various private and public companies. He has an Honours Business Administration degree from the University of Western Ontario. He will do the introductions of the panelists themselves, but please join me, join me in welcoming them to the podium, to the stage. Thanks, Gina. I'm going to have everyone uh, join me up here, and then I'm going to do some intros as we go down. And I'll have each of you, I'll do a brief intro of all the members of the panel and let them tell them a little bit about their companies. But I want to talk a little bit about, do a little bit of a promo for the Investment Accelerator Fund as well. As Gina mentioned, the Investment Accelerator Fund invests in companies, and we can invest up to $500,000 in any one company, and we're doing seed stage investments, but we're also uh, kicked off a new program for the province called the Youth Investment Accelerator Fund. And what we're doing here is we can also invest in companies that we're targeting, companies with entrepreneurs in the ages of 18 to 29, really helping the province sort of kickstart in this in the youth uh, employment side. And uh, it, we can invest up to $250,000. And we do the same type of investment as we would for the normal IAF. We have an independent investment committee that looks at all our investments and vets them, but this is a new program for us. We've made eight investments in the youth uh, program to date, and we're looking for more opportunities in that as well. So that's a little bit about the Investment Accelerator Fund. This is called the 360 panel because it, it includes venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. I actually like doing this because it gives a chance to, to look at things from both perspectives here. 
and sort of getting feedback and information from how the VCs look at investment opportunities. But we also have some entrepreneurs here to keep them honest and say what the uh, entrepreneurs also see in this program and how they, how they look at raising venture capital. So right here on my left is Remy El Ahmad. And uh, Remy has a, a strong technical background with a, BA, with a bachelor's in applied science and honors mechatronics from the uh, University of Waterloo and also Master's of Engineering and Computer Science from the University of Guelph. And he's uh, had positions as sort of engineer, programmer, analyst, and product manager prior to starting his own company, uh, co-founder of a company Push, which is a startup uh, with a goal of revolutionizing the way athletes train. And the IAF is an investor in Push. It's one of our uh, most recent investments under the youth IAF, and we've been really impressed with Rami and what he's doing. And, uh, and, and building his company. So I'm going to talk, let Rami talk a little bit about PUSH, and then I'm just going to go down the line and introduce everybody then after we go through this process. So Rami, tell us a little bit about PUSH. Sure. Uh, what I have here is essentially what I've been working on for the past two years, and it, it's, it's, it's almost an honor to be here on the stage because about two years ago I was, in, I was standing in the audience listening to some of the advice, and a lot of the advice I actually got from these Entrepreneurship 101 lectures helped us uh, along the way. So. It's great that you're all here. Um, in terms of what we do is, this is a wearable technology. It's a wearable armband that can help athletes track and analyze their strength training performance. So what we initially set out to do is, and this was largely born out of conversations we've had with the strength and conditioning coaches at the University of Toronto. Uh, we've noticed that a lot of the tools that they use to objectively analyze the performance of their athletes are antiquated, difficult, and expensive. And we wanted to develop something that's much easier, much more lightweight, and leverages smartphones. And that's kind of what we set out to do about two years ago. And since then, we've uh, launched a crowdfunding campaign and we've uh, rolled out a beta program that has some of the teams here in the University of Toronto using it. So that's about it. Okay, thanks. thanks. And around his left is Mike Siligatze. And Mike is the co CEO and co-founder of Top Hat Monocle. And Mike has worked in engineering roles at Siemens and General Motors and Kimberly Clark, and was also one of the very early uh, employees and the head of R&D at MyoVision Technologies out of Waterloo. And he co-founded Top Hat, which is an educational software company. And the IF was an early investor in Top Hat as well. We actually invested. Uh, we had a rule within the ventures within within the IF is that you cannot make an investment in companies that have over five hundred thousand dollars in revenue. We're there to be very early stage investors. And we started talking to Mike. He was less than five hundred thousand in revenue, but by the time we went to make our investment, he was ramping his business so fast we had to change the rules that we can now invest in companies when we meet them. They have to be less than five hundred thousand in revenues because he was. <laughs> ramping it so quickly. So uh, uh, he's continued to grow rapidly and has raised a significant amount of venture capital, but I'll let him tell you a little bit more about Top Hat. Mike? Cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the Top Hat uh, essentially is a teaching platform. Uh, what it allows uh, instructors, uh, primarily in university, to do is to engage their, uh, their audience, to uh, present their slides, share their notes with their students, ask questions, and get instant feedback in class, where students participate uh, in those uh, uh, activities using their own devices, their smartphones, their laptops, or whatever they have. So it transforms classrooms from being passive and more didactic to being much more engaging and interactive. Uh, we've been at it now for, I guess, over four years now, I guess almost five years, which is hard to believe. Um, uh, since then, we've uh, grown to uh, about 80 employees. We've got uh, about 400 universities that are using uh, Top Hat right now. Uh, pretty good revenues uh, and, and growing quickly. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been pretty fun. Mike, thanks. And uh, next to Mike is uh, Duncan Hill. And Duncan's a general partner at Mantel Venture Partners. And, and Duncan is also an entrepreneur in that he was the founder and CTO of Think Dynamics, which was a data center automation software company that was sold to IBM in 2003. And then I worked closely with Duncan. He joined Ventures West when I was at Ventures West as an entrepreneur in residence, helping us look at companies. And then he and, and uh, Robin Axon uh, spun out and really set up their own fund, uh, Mantella Ventures. And it's, he'll tell you a little bit about it, but I think you know, that Mantella is one of the, what I call the new breed of venture capital firms in that it's a young entrepreneurial group themselves, uh, really focused on some uh, early stage companies. And I'll tell you, let you tell a little bit more about it. Duncan, why don't you? Thanks, Barry. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, Mantella uh, Venture Partners is a $23 million early stage fund. Um, fairly different than perhaps other venture funds that you might see out there. It really got born out of uh, Robin and I just like being entrepreneurs and wanted to build companies. And uh, we're good at the first, uh, the early stages of a company, not so much later. And we wanted to do that over and over again. So uh, we started out working with a couple of great entrepreneurs um, to uh, built uh, two companies, Push Life and Chango, 
And um, through that process, we ended up attracting some capital. And when we had the opportunity to have a $23 million fund, it, we looked at it and thought, yeah, we can do a lot more of it. So since that time, we've done a total of nine, uh, nine companies. Two of them have sold, um, one to Google and one to Rogers. The other seven are still going. They range in size from about 10 employees is the smallest one right now, and the biggest is Chango at about 120. Um, and uh, we're, we take a very hands-on approach. You know, we set out to want to build companies, so we work with uh, great entrepreneurs, um, great founders to to start companies and to to build them. So we're a little different. We're not um, typically out there looking at everything that goes around um, around the circuit, looking for venture funding. We're often involved a lot earlier with the uh, with the founders before they even have anything to go out and show. So uh, that's, uh, that's what we do. And next to Duncan is Benton Leung, and Benton is uh, with, uh, with Golden Triangle Angel Network, and Benton also is an entrepreneur, and he was co-founder of MapleSoft, which is a developer of mathematical computation systems, systems uh, for scientists and engineers, and, and it was an early spin-out from the University of Waterloo back in 1986. It was acquired by Cybernetics. He went on to found another company, Radical Flow, which also has interactive math technologies for textbooks and curriculum wear. But most important, Benton is an angel investor. And I wanted to get that on the panel because there's a lot of activity in the, in the technology ecosystem right now, you know, the ecosystem with really angels playing a major role. And uh, he's an active angel investor himself with investments over 10 companies, sits on several boards. He's a founding member of the Golden Triangle Angel Network and is on their selection committee uh, and chair of the education committee. But most importantly, he's a recipient in 2012 of their Community Builder of, of the Year Award. So Benton, why don't you talk a little bit about G10? Thank, thanks, Barry. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, G10, like many of the angel groups that are uh, throughout Southern Ontario meets on a fairly regular basis and our mission is to support fairly early stage companies. And of course, being here in Southern Ontario, whether it's in Ontario or at Waterloo, we see some terrific opportunities. Uh, primarily because I, I would say the universities that are so strong here in terms of the technical talent that is available <laughs> And in, in, in fact, I, I know that some of my colleagues in angel groups throughout the US are actually jealous of the opportunities that are here. So for example, uh, one year we did put together a syndicated deal with the uh, Boston Harbor Angels uh, for a company that, uh, up in Ottawa. It was a fairly large round, uh, $2 million. Typically angel investors don't invest in that level but here's a company that, that really needed it, and, and, and through our partnership with a U.S. angel group, we were able to sort of fill the vo void. Uh, and in, in, in our discussions with the U.S. angel group, they say they, there are 20 angel groups in Boston. They fight for the scraps off the MIT table. They come here to southern uh, uh, Ontario, and they said, Benton, this is virgin territory for us. Right? So, so we're attracting capital fr from the U.S. Uh, and and, and, and GTAN is, is glad to syndicate deals with other angel groups and with uh, uh, U.S. investors as well. Thanks, Ben. So my first question for the panel is going to be targeted at the venture capitalists on the panel. And I guess if I'm in the audience and I'm an entrepreneur and, and I'm trying to tap into the venture uh, community and trying to get an investment, you know, I get a little frustrated because I'm not sure exactly what they're looking for. I think I've got a great company, but I'd like, to, I'd like for you to comment as to what you, three key things that you look for, not necessarily the most logical, like, you know, big market, because we all know that's going to be one of them, but what sort of differentiates good opportunities in your mind, Duncan? Like, what are some of the things that you look for? Sure. Um, I, uh, you know, the, the stock answer would be, you know, the three legs of the stool for us are certainly people market and product in that order. Um, but let me go in a little deeper into what we look for in each of those different things, because that's where I think the more meaningful, more meaningful uh, content is. So start with people, because in the, when you're looking at an early stage company, that is by far the most important thing. Who are the founders that you're, that you're going to be backing? Because more often than not, whatever they're coming in to talk to you about from a product perspective is not likely going to be what they're going to find success with. They're going to zig and zag along the way. Um, they're going to learn from their market. They're going to have to change um, and adapt very, very quickly in an iterative fashion. So you need to find people that you believe are capable of that, as well as everything else that goes around building a company. So first and foremost, we're looking for a really strong product skill set in the founding team. If they're not good product people, 
that's a really hard thing to bring in. They may not be the right product people long, long term. You know, they might not have the discipline for a bigger product and a, you know, that's got a lot of different inputs from different customers where you need to hire someone that does that later. But early stage, you need a really good product, uh, product skill set. Um, from a personality perspective, they need to be persistent. They have to have a sense of urgency. You know, um, I, I can think of some of the some of the people that we've had where, you know, they didn't take no for an answer. Now, that doesn't mean being belligerent. It meant every time they came back, they had answered the things that you'd thrown them the last time. They kept coming back, and if if you had pushback, they kept coming back with with answers to to what your issues were. So they're very persistent, and you need that. I mean, you're going to have to break through a lot of walls in order to get to uh, get to the finish line with any company. So. Persistence is important. Domain expertise is pretty important. Um, this is another one that you can't really hire into the company, and that's strong market product strategic vision. And I think of, so first, you gotta have it. You gotta have a really good view to how you're changing the market that you're going into, um, how you're gonna enter that market, how you'll be successful in that market, why the market needs you. Um, but it also, I, I've seen some people that come in with a good vision like that, and then three months later, it's identical. And three months later, it's still the same one. And the, the, the people that we find are really great are the ones who are constantly learning from the market as they engage with it, even before they build product. And it's constantly evolving, it's constantly evolving their view of that market. And, and you can see that. Um, Ray Reddy, the founder of Push Life, you know, he was incredible that way. He pushed back on something, he'd, yep. A week later, he'd come back, and he had a, you know, his his vision of it had shifted, and you knew that there was a lot of good thought behind it. Um, Got to be able to raise capital. That's a really important one. If the person's not good at that whole process, that's going to be a challenge for us as an early stage investor. We just get stuck having to keep giving them more money because they can't attract anyone else. So that's pretty important, and attract great people. You know, you need to build an amazing team. If you haven't, if you're not somebody that we believe that can really attract great people, that's a problem. And to do those last two things. Really important thing I find, and, and I think this is really underrated, is being a good storyteller. Because to get people to buy into your vision, you can put a bunch of numbers on a, on a chart, and that doesn't get anyone emotionally bought in. You gotta be a great storyteller. That's what gets investors on board. That's what gets people on board. Um, so that's people. Can I just take one more yeah, minute? Sure. So market, market would be the next most important thing. Just a couple of things to say about that. A good ecosystem of partners and acquirers in the market. You know, if you're building something into a, mar into a market where there's really no big companies out there that buy technology, that's a little bit scary for an investor. Now, you know, really going to IPO is your only option for that business if there's not, uh, not acquirers and, and, and strong, and companies that are used to partnering with technology in that market. Um, evidence of past venture multiples. Sometimes there's acquisitions in those markets, but you know, for one times revenue or something like that, they're just not used to paying up for technology, and that's also a problem in a particular market. And then where there's efficient or clever channels in that market that you've identified, you've understood that market well enough to see that there's efficient ways to get to market. It's not just buying PPC ads is gonna be your route to market or hiring loads and loads of salespeople to, to have to invest lots of time to sell each customer. Um, you know, clever ways of doing that. Actually, Top Hat's a great example of that. In a market where most of the companies that are going after higher education were going in and trying to sell, in, sell universities at an administrative level, really, really hard to do. Like, that would scare the crap out of me. They walk into that market and say, no, we have a way of, do, of turning this whole model on its head. We give the professor tools that they need in order to do a better job of teaching their class that offers value to the students and then the students pay. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I hope I'm not. But that was a really, really clever new view into that market. And that's the sort of thing that an investor can get behind. Last thing, product. You've got to be solving a real problem. You know, we see a lot of stuff out there that is not really solving a problem. And if I can't understand the problem it's solving, I'm gonna have a hard time getting my head around it. Um, and it needs to be something we can validate early. If, you're sell if, if you come and say, look, I'm gonna have to develop for two years to build something so I can put it out there to find out if anyone wants it, that doesn't happen much anymore. That's pretty scary. Um, this is another one. You know, Robin actually always asks this question, why now? You know, Emerging technology needs to be making this possible now. If it was possible to do five years ago, why wasn't it done five years ago? The world's not you know, sitting asleep out there. Um, 
but if you can sort of, this is part of that telling the good story, you know, because we have this and this now and the markets now, you know, the people are in this state now and they're used to this kind of thinking, we can now do this where it really wasn't doable before. That's really, really important. Um, and it's gonna be hard to do still. You know, you've gotta have some way of making this a defensible thing if it's not hard to do. And it doesn't mean that you've got intellectual property as in patents, but you know, if your, first, if your market um, first mover advantage can get you in and you can build up a network effect that creates some defensibility in that market. You know, one of our companies, Crowdcare, is a great example of this. What they're doing is extremely hard, but even that aside, they're, they're one of the first in the market doing what they're doing, and they're gonna build up a database of knowledge in this thing, which is gonna be really hard for anyone else to catch up and win uh, or, and overtake. And once you get up to a certain mass of that you know, ingrained knowledge in the system, for any customer coming to it, they could look at a new entrant that has this much knowledge in their system or this one that has that much, and if the knowledge is the value, it's kind of a no-brainer for the customer to go where they're gonna get the most value. So um, that's it, that's, that's okay. what I'd say. Benton, anything that you, that's, I know those are, I covered a lot, anything that you look at as well for, yeah. it's key. Well, I, I would repeat some of the same things that uh, uh, Duncan has said. Yeah. Certainly when we take a look at very early stage companies, it's the people that we're really investing in, not so much the product. Uh, often founders come to us and they think that the opposite is, is true. But in fact, in, in people, we're looking for uh, great leaders. So, uh, in the CEO, we're looking for someone who can lead a team and understands that he probably doesn't have all the skill sets within himself uh, in order to really sort of drive the company. And if that person can recognize that, I think that they have the potential of building a great uh, management team. Uh, we also look for, for someone who understands that uh, uh, he needs to share, or he or she needs to share. And so we, we discovered that during our negotiations with term sheets and, 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 and agreements. And we also look at the way that they reward the, the, their team members. You know, if, if, if they're trying to keep too much of the uh, uh, property of the company, or the equity in the company in themselves, then it's probably not going to be a, a, uh, a leader who, who knows how to work with others and with investors. Uh, and then, and then, and then uh, also to repeat something that Duncan said, we, we look for perseverance in a, uh, in a leader. And so one of the, the, the best CEOs that, that we've invested in is someone who was a former mountain climber. This guy does not give up. His COO or CTO is someone who was a world-class jujitsu champion. Right? With these two people at the helm of the company, they will, they will work their asses off. They will not give up. And if there's a barrier, they'll find a way of getting around it. And so we, we look for that pers perseverance because we know that the road ahead is not always very smooth or very easy. And you've got to solve, you've got to solve tough problems and, and not give up. <laughs> we're, we're there to back them. But we want to understand yeah. that those leaders have that sort of uh, 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 quality of perseverance. And, and Benton makes sure he never crosses those two guys as well because it, it was, <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that, that came up when Duncan mentioned, and I know this is important to, to, from the IF when we look at things, and that's really that presentation. And, and you know, that really has to be able to hit home, et cetera. So and everyone out here is saying, okay, how do, I, how, do I get, how do I hone that presentation? What do I need to do to get that across? So you two gentlemen have done that. You've had to go and pitch to VCs and get that presentation out. So what do you, advice do you give the audience as to what they need to do on that? How do I fine tune it? How do I get advice? How do I build that presentation? How do I build that story? Right. Sure. Um, uh, I guess it's very different uh, depending on the stage of, uh, of company. I guess I'll talk more about the kind of very early uh, stage, kind of maybe where, where you've got the product, you've got some early traction, and you're trying to get some first capital into the, uh, the company. Um, in that stage, what you're really trying to uh, uh, do is to convince the, uh, the investor that there's at least some kernel of an idea that you've got enough validation that uh, um, you know, there's, there's likely a business uh, there. Um, uh, and just show that you understand the market, that the, you know, the source of the, uh, uh, the idea is uh, some personal kind of knowledge. I think the storytelling is, is really probably the most critical aspect at that point because in that early stage, really, I mean, 90% of what the investors are putting money into is, is the people, I guess, to, to reiterate what was already said. You know, everybody has, I know everybody kind of has this uh, uh, notion that you know their idea is precious and they came up with this amazing idea and that's you know that's gold and they usually try to hold on to it very tightly 
Um, but I mean, the reality is the idea is worthless, like in and of itself. 99% of the value is in the execution. So, so the investment comes really into the team that's actually able to execute and iterate on the, uh, on the idea. So what you want to convey uh, to the investors in, in the, uh, the presentation um, is that there's that understanding of the market. So uh, some more, I guess, very concrete practical advice. There's a really good book called, uh, it was uh, The Art of the Start uh, by Guy Kawasaki. That's a really awesome resource if you want to read about how to structure a pitch deck. It's, you know, usually you want, I think, like 10 to 15 slides. There's a very standard kind of structure of all the you know, usual things that you want to cover, like market size, you know, team, product, you know, problem, solution, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, go to market and, and so on. Uh, so just following that formula is very uh, uh, standard and that'll work. Make sure it looks pretty, so get a designer to look over it. Um, and then beyond that, uh, and this is very important, you'll probably screw up like the first 10 pitches that you do. Uh, they'll go horribly. You won't understand what, you know, what, question, what questions are being asked. You know, they won't understand your answers and so on. So make sure that as you go out there and you know, pitch, the first few pitches need to be ones that uh, are either friendly or are the lowest uh, priority <laughs> ones that uh, you're going after. So, um, so go and then the, iterate uh, on that uh, so, as you go forward. So go to the VCs that you think you have the, less, the least opportunity of getting traction with and save the better ones for the last. Sure, yeah, exactly, that's, right? that's okay. ultimately what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's important because so, okay. you yeah. will absolutely screw up the first, yeah. literally about 10 pitches you will screw up. So that's okay. Just need to. So, so Ram, how did you? How did? Because you, you again, you did a great job at, at pitching this. But how did you then? How did you hone that? Like, what did you do? How, where, where did you get sort of the coaching? I guess if you're talking to the audience here, how do how do they get help in sort of making that pitch? Uh, I found, and this is something that I'm starting to learn how to do better now, which is uh, doing more of the storytelling. Uh, I think that's something that I initially very much focused on, following a, a structured pitch where I would talk about the problem the solution that we're presenting, the alternatives, market opportunity size, and just walk people through that. Um, what I did most to try to learn how to change it and add a bit of kind of an interesting story to it is really just listen to and watch some great keynote speakers on YouTube, essentially. I would just go on and watch Steve Jobs present the iPhone, the iPod, and just listen over and over again, try to monitor uh, the way, you know, it's, it's the art of imitation to some extent. So you want to see how, how does he walk, what is he trying to do, uh, how does he use his facial gestures, and you try to learn a bit of, the, of that, and then I would just practice on my co-founders, actually. Um, just practice over and over again uh, to a point where you essentially more or less memorize it, and that's kind of, that's when I would go in front of the VCs that I highly value, that I knew that I just didn't want to waste the opportunity with. And something that I'm starting to learn to do now is, it's good to have a pitch deck, but sometimes you want to at least test the waters to see if you can do a less formal interaction with the VC. I think VCs are also getting used to having someone come in with a PDF, very frozen, stick it into the computer, put it up on a projector, and walk them through a pitch deck. At least see if they're interested in having a conversation that's a bit more casual first and see if maybe that's a better way of going about it. And I think, personally, I'm, I'm finding that that's probably a better way than immediately jumping right into a pitch. I love so. somebody that knows what they're doing, that knows their yeah. business well enough that they would rather just talk and go up to a whiteboard and pull up the odd spreadsheet or whatever they need to for backup. Yeah. If they know it that cold, yeah. because more, more yeah. often than not, I mean, if anyone's ever, if any of you have ever been in and talked to Robin or I, you get about one slide in before we're all over it anyway. And you're yeah. jumping Literally through your whole deck. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Yeah, you were. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point, because we had a company come in here, actually, and did, and did the same thing to, to an yeah. outside investor, and they got them right away. Like, they just totally did not follow the slide deck at all, went right up and said, okay, let's get onto the product and take a look at it's, it. So you great. have to be prepared to be able to do that and make that. It shows make you that really pitch. know your stuff yeah. cold. Anything that, uh, anything, uh, they, anything they shouldn't do, anything that. Yes. that, that uh, <laughs> uh, so so, so I've, I've, got, I've got my seven sins. I won't, I won't go into the seven sins of, 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 of pitching, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing, one common mistake that uh, founders make and is, is that they over communicate. They want to prove to us how much they know and they're just shoving data and, and information at us. Your job is not to over-communicate, but to communicate well. Steve Jobs is actually a great role model for all, for all of you to follow. So, so I do encourage you to go onto YouTube and see some of the keynote presentations that he gives. There's also an excellent book called The Presentation Secrets of Steve Jobs. I would suggest that everybody read that. What you're, what you're trying to do is not to 
tell everything to, to the first person that you meet. What you're trying to do is to tell enough that you catch their interest and you make an emotional connection with that person. You are talking to investors as people and you want to make that connection. You want them to believe your story. Right? And sometimes that's, that's done more sort of on an emotional level. And, and Steve Jobs does this very well. He doesn't talk about the details or the product specs. He talks about the benefits and how it will change your life. This is the way that you should be communicating. You ought to tell us about how your company is going to make a change to, with consumers or how you'll be able to help people uh, 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 be more effective. Uh, it's, it's the benefits rather than, than the uh, details. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna, uh, the other thing that we're seeing happen in, in the ecosystem right now is that there's a lot of, uh, of accelerators uh, out there that are really helping early stage companies. Uh, there's Grow Labs, Founders Field, Extreme Labs, D DMZ, there's Jolt, there's Hyperdrive, there's Creative Destruction Labs, et cetera. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to get coaching and to gain some capital with these companies. In the, U in the US, it's Techstars and uh, what's the, the major, anyway? Y Combinator. Y Combinator, thank you. So I wanted to ask, uh, I've asked Rami to give us a little bit, because been, you've been through two of the accelerators here, mm -hmm. and so I wanted you to sort of just comment as to the benefit or some of the negatives, what you think you can get out of that, and is there anything that you'd recommend to the audience here in that area to sort of help with their startups? Mm -hmm. uh, what, I, what I would recommend is actually a great way to practice your pitch, just apply. Uh, just filling out the application forms, you tend to either way kind of really, uh, you're forced to break down your thought process a little bit. Uh, you, you practice with them, it's quite low risk. Um, there's a lot of different accelerators and I think there's gonna be more and more in the future around here. Uh, so you have plenty of options to kind of pick and choose from. I would highly encourage you to apply to as many as you can. Uh, one thing I would recommend is look at the business that you're in and try to figure out, look at the previous Investors and accelerators usually behave in patterns. You want to, if they have been successful uh, investing in one category, they're more likely to invest in it again. Uh, so if you see some accelerators that have done really well with wearable tech, for example, like the Creative Destruction Lab, then that immediately kind of incentivized me to apply to them to work in the, to, and I knew that I probably had a better chance of getting in than anywhere else. Uh, one thing I would emphasize, I would want to advise just so that there's no confusion around the two different accelerators we're part of, I would definitely wouldn't recommend going to two accelerators that are both dilutive in terms of equity. Uh, Jolt invests in you, but they also take a, an equity stake in it, and that's great. Um, but you, Creative Destruction Lab doesn't do that, but they also don't invest in you. So uh, just, I wouldn't recommend going to two accelerators that are going to take equity from you because typically the valuations they're providing aren't very high. So you don't want to do too many of those in a row. You want to do one and then immediately start thinking about your street round and how that's going to look like um, and look for a valuation bump in that process. I don't know if I got too technical there, but in general, accelerators are great. I, I do recommend you interview with them, talk to them. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you at this point. Like I mentioned, there's quite a number of them in the city. Um, really look at the kind of startups that they've done in the past. And something that I've, uh, I've learned that's really crucial is also uh, look at, try to walk the space that you're going to be working in and talk to the startups that are there. Uh, that's going to give you a really great insight into two things. Are you going to mesh well with the other startups that are there? Because that's really important. You're going to be working with them for 12, 14 hour days, if not more. And uh, to top it off, it helps you also get some insight into how does the accelerator actually function in and of itself. And entrepreneurs tend to have a sense of solidarity between them, so you'll be able to get some really interesting insights. And from the VC perspective, do you gentlemen see value in looking at companies that are coming out of those accelerators? Does it make a difference to you? Do you see any, any benefit? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, having not been through one myself, I, I don't know everything that you, you do in those 12 to 14 hour days in the accelerator you know, beyond building your business. But uh, certainly, you know, from the outside, you can see that they're, you know, one of their major goals is to help you get the capital. funding. Yeah. You know, so they're trying to create a platform that attracts investors to come and look at your, at your uh, demo day or your pitch day. And um, through the quality of the companies that they, that they put out. And, uh, and um, you know, you can look at their track record of companies that got funded out of the back end of, the, of that accelerator to know whether or not they're being fairly successful. And certainly what I've seen is a lot of the time that they've spent with some of the companies that, that have come to us has been more on preparing the pitch, yeah. you know, asking the right questions. Now, beyond to prepare the pitch, there's a lot of work that has to get done in behind the scenes. It's not just about how to make it pretty. It's you haven't answered this question, you haven't answered that question, and you better answer it this way, then you go off and do the work. 
Um, so I think for for first time entrepreneurs, it can be it can be very helpful. Yeah. We re we rely on the accelerator centers to the degree that 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 we're successful with the forty or so, some odd investments that we've made. It's it's be because of the fact that the accelerator centers have done the heavy lifting for us. We don't take opportunities that just walk in off the street. We, we just simply don't have the resources to qualify them as uh, angel investors. And so we rely on the uh, accelerator centers, whether it's Jolt here or Hyperdrive in, in, in Waterloo, to feed us their best opportunities. And they will provide the pitch coaching, they will provide the business mentorships to help these companies get ready to make a proper investment pitch. And by the time they come to us, they're very well vetted. And, 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 and these to us are high quality opportunities. Mike, I gotta change it up a little bit, and, and uh, I want you to, because I know you've raised a, a very significant round, I think an $8 million round with that was led by USVC, and uh, a couple other partners in that round and are continuing to look for expanding your capital base. So how do you pull in US venture firms? So if you're looking at that, what stage do you have to be at? What gets their attention? And what advice could you give the audience on, on, on that side? And then what do you expect from the venture firm as well? I'm just curious as to you know, what you think you should be getting in return from any venture firm that comes into your, your company. So. Uh, sure. So um, I, I, this is the, I'll talk about our experience uh, with angel funding. Um, uh, this, I think, has changed to some extent today. But uh, you know, I'll give my overview. Uh, when we were raising angel funds, so very early stage capital, this was when we you know, had a prototype and a little bit of, uh, a little bit of revenue. Um, it was very difficult to raise money from angel investors uh, you know, in, in the US or from seed funds or anything like that because I guess there's enough opportunity you know, around those areas and typically the seed funds want to be pretty closely involved. The angel investors want to be, be able to come and you know, have a coffee with you when, when they need to. Um, so, it was, so it was difficult. Whereas when you're at a later stage, you know, series A or a series B, at that point kind of the world is your market when you're raising uh, capital because you have enough metrics and uh, you know they're investing in a real business at this point. It's not. It's probably not going to switch to something totally different at that point. Uh, uh, whereas at a seed stage, I mean, you you're, you could be pivoting every couple months until you figure it out. So, um, so in those early days, it becomes harder. However, uh, it's still certainly possible, and I, I know of uh, uh, startups uh, that are you know a little more uh, advanced in the very earliest stages that are going to seed funds and investors in, in the U.S. The way they do that, there's a couple of strategies. One that's kind of standard, most people have heard of it, is Angel List. That's a great place to list your startup and get connected with. Uh, uh, with angel investors. Um, we actually raised a bit of, we were one of the first companies to raise money uh, through that. Uh, we connected with some guy and it was such a bizarre experience. We, we posted our profile there, we got a couple of introductions. We connected with a guy via Skype in Germany, he was in Munich. Um, and then after two or three Skype calls, he just said, yeah, I'm interested. And then he wired us $100,000. <laughs> it was a pretty weird uh, experience. Uh, uh, but he's been awesome. He's actually made a ton of really great intros and uh, uh, has been actually really, uh, really helpful overall. Um, so anyway, so AngelList is, is great. Uh, you know, seed funds are really helpful. So people like, you know, Felicis or SoftTech or... Uh, uh, I mean, there's tons of these uh, guys in the in the uh, in the U.S. Um, the way to meet those investors uh, uh, is always through introductions. Um, so what you need is to talk to other founders that have raised uh, funding. That's usually the best strategy: arrange a meeting or a coffee with them, and then have them introduce you to um, um, their you know their investors. That's uh, uh, that's probably the best approach. And sorry, and what was the second question? Uh, oh, just what, what do you expect from them? What what, what's, what oh, are you looking um, for from the VC that comes into into the company? So I guess I'll say what we're not looking for and what most companies shouldn't look for. Um, you shouldn't look for uh, the VCs to help you run your company. Um, I guess in some cases, I mean, you, there's uh, uh, certain cases where that might happen, but it's almost so, usually not a good thing, actually. Um, the investors aren't going to help you in the operational sense because you, you know your market better than anybody, ideally. Uh, you know your, you know, the problems that you're having that day are very specific and there's thousands of facts that are involved. So, so it's difficult to get very nitty gritty kind of day to day advice. The most significant value we've gotten, um, aside obviously from the capital, um, has been kind of branding, which is awareness that, you know, if we raise money from, you know, we raise money from a pretty good US VC, uh, people are aware of that and that helps you recruit people, it just gives you kind of a, a clout, I guess, in, in the world. 
uh, that's that's actually significant. That that's makes it really great a great way to recruit top uh, talent into your company. Um, and second of all, they have a network um, again that's very helpful uh, for recruiting for bringing in really top uh, quality of uh, you know developers or you know or executives or anything like that. Um, those are the things that have been most uh, uh, useful. And then in addition, I guess it's always helpful to have somebody to use as a sounding board, and that's kind of our board of directors and you know other other people that are involved in the in the funds. Because a lot of times, you know, you might have an idea and you think it's amazing, and then you talk to them and they'll say, no, here's you know here's the three reasons why it's stupid, uh, and that's really great to hear. Because a lot of times, you know, within your company, you're uh, you're all kind of in it, kind of together. You're you almost have a tunnel vision in some ways. It's very easy. It becomes easy to convince yourself that something's a good idea. Um, you know, especially if you know if you're the founder of the company, people just kind of you know will agree with you. Um, so it's good to have a third party that's involved and objective that tells you when you're being stupid. Uh, those are kind of the most useful things I would say from that we've gotten out of it. I guess one of the things that I know when any company coming out and you're looking to get to find venture capital, but you're also sort of saying, how much capital should I get? I've been bootstrapping my company. I don't really want to to uh, to give away too much of my company. But what's how do you from the VC side? How do you look at this and say, okay, what's the right amount? Or what do you look for as far as the capital that's required to get a company going? And, and sort of what's the right amount that I'm out looking for capital? How do I determine what I should be looking for? Sure. I mean, what I like to see, I mean, again, we're very early stage. And, and I, I, you know, I, I like the idea of funding appropriately in the early stage because it keeps a lot of options open. You want to make sure you have enough to, to see yourself through some storms. So, you know, if I'm looking at a, at a, at a business, we're looking at some milestones that we believe that we need to hit in order to go and raise a next round of capital at a significantly higher valuation. And then we build a plan to look at how we're going to hit those milestones. What's it going to cost to get to that place for the amount of time it's going to take? And you want to wrap that in some padding for the things that are kind of going to come along and then look at that and say, well, that's the amount of money that, that we need to raise. So it's not a you know, needs to be this, and I don't ever like hearing someone just comes in and goes, well, you know, because that gets me 18 months. Well, what are you going to do with 18 months? Or that gets me 12 months. Well, what are you going to do with 12 months? Where are we going to be at the end of that 12 months or 18 months? So I'd like to have a, an understanding of, of, um, of what they're trying to accomplish. Then now we know what we're going after. We know how much money we need to do it. Pat it out a little for the, for the, for the rough times that are inevitably going to happen. I, I think that one of the uh, worst uses of a CEO's time is to go hat in hand from group to group, whether it's angel groups or, 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 or VCs. Uh, I would rather have that person be back at the company talking to customers or leading the team. And therefore, I think that, that, that the uh, company really needs a significant runway, uh, at, at least 12 months. And in order to be fair to the company, especially during the very early stages when the valuation could be quite low, what we want to do is to provide sort of a, uh, a tranche investment where it comes in, in in several tranches, but tied into milestones that we can agree upon so that once you hit those milestones, right, one, there's something to, for, the, uh, for the company to be targeting, and then two, the, the valuation, the rise in valuation is justified. Uh, so, so it's fair to both the investors and to the company. Good. I'm going to throw it open to questions. Shortly, I'm just going to ask one more question here. So if you have questions, just step up to the mic. Because I actually found that last year, uh, really the questions from the audience, it's your, it's your time here. So you may have some questions that you'd like to ask the panel. So just uh, be ready to ask some questions. Uh, I guess what I was going to ask Rami is, is uh, you know, you're up against the, the, uh, this mean venture capitalist, and you're that lonely entrepreneur trying to decide whether this is a good deal or not. Yeah. How, where do you get advice? What do you, where, did you, where did you find uh, advice in just dealing with, you know, with the term sheet and looking at and sort of approaching them and, and just sort of working with the VCs? Who coached you, or how did you deal with that? I think I relied on three key resources at that point. Uh, some of the, and this is kind of goes back to the accelerators, some of the advisors that we've had through them. Uh, have been phenomenal in helping us kind of really uh, figure out what's, is this a good deal for us to take or not, and how should we negotiate. And also, just reading up online, re really going online to a couple of a couple of blogs that I follow regularly that have a lot of interesting conversations around uh, deals and how they should be structured. And thirdly, it's probably uh, just talking to other entrepreneurs. So 
we generally speaking, before we got anything, we, I would run it by a couple of friends that I've developed through going to meetups, and uh, I know that they're going through that journey, so I just chat with them a little bit and see you know, what they got offered and then what we got offered, and then we do a bit of a comparison. So those are the three resources. Questions? Anybody have any questions from the audience? How did each of you individually consider, how did you consider your early valuations as entrepreneurs mm -hmm. without necessarily having the typical EBITDA? And how do you as investors take risks on entrepreneurs um, with valuations that don't correlate to EBITDA? So I guess I can, maybe I'll present some of a contrarian view. I think it's mostly made up. Um, it's very much a market dynamic. Uh, today, a valuation of 10 million for a company that's pre-revenue is reasonable in some parts of the world and some markets, um, you know, in certain spaces that you're founding a company, whereas a couple of years ago that would have been completely insane. So it's very much a market dynamic. Um, ideally, you're going in, you know, with the least, um, and it gets more rational the later you get, I would say, like as you're getting into Series A, Series B, it starts being based on more actual revenue multiples, but before that, it's, you know, it's how impressive is the founder, what's their track record, you know, how big is the market, how good is the team, and all of that is mostly made up, like how many other f investors are interested, how much of a, it, so it's, it's purely kind of a sales market that's dynamic. That's the way I would, uh, I would say it. So there's no, I guess the answer is there is no rational system. It's, it's just how hot is the market today versus you know, there a month a, ago. <laughs> there is often a, for an area, for a geography, a, a typical range for a seed or a series A, but you can go outside of that too. It is very much market, you know, it's, how bad do you want to sell, do you need that money and how bad do the people that you're talking to want a piece of what you're doing? You know, if you've got no, create options for yourself is a great way to get in the higher end of the range. You don't want to get too far out of that range. I mean, one thing, of, you know, you could, you might convince a, somebody their first time angel investing to give you money at a really high valuation because they don't know any better. Uh, it doesn't generally end well because you probably won't hit milestones with that money that are going to justify that valuation on your next round. And then you're going to have, you know, you and that investor are going to have a lot of indigestion when you go and talk to the next round of investors. Yeah. So just to add one piece of practical advice to what you guys were recommending is AngelList has a small feature called valuations. So if you go on AngelList, you click on valuations and you can separate it out by geography. You can also just, it's just a good way to back up what you're trying to, whatever valuation you come up with. It is totally made up at the end of the day, but you can use that to kind of give you a rough indicator. So if for wearable companies, typical seed valuations in the four to five million range in the valley, then you, it's a safe assumption that you're probably going to be in the three million range here in Canada. It depends on where you raise ultimately as well, as well but that's a play, good place to look. And it's a very, I, I want to emphasize the point that you don't necessarily want a very high valuation. That can really hurt you. So a lot of entrepreneurs go out there trying to get the highest price. Um, you don't want to get a low price, but a lot of times a high price will come and bite you in the in the butt. And Most it's been because of the, that next round. I mean, it has to be, you have to have a reasonable value for the next round of funding. And, and if you get too far ahead of yourself, then it makes that, that second round, you still need that capital. It makes mm -hmm. that next round very hard to, 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 to fund. I mean, the other, thing, the other thing around that too is there is the, the next round, but then there's also even, even now, I mean, you, the investor needs to get an, enough ownership of the company to give a damn so you get some of that value out of them. Mm -hmm. um, the investor shouldn't want to take too much away from the founding team that they, another round or two from now, are looking at what they own and going, geez, I've fully vested this. I've barely owned anything of it anymore. Why am I doing this? You know, you, you want to make sure that everybody is motivated through, through the life of the company, and that's important, and there is a bit of a, a balance there. That is true, and, 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 and smart investors will understand that they want to keep you well motivated. So, in fact, they don't want too much of your company. Uh, a, a device that some, some investors and companies use uh, during the very early stages because there's so few metrics that are available to help us evaluate your company that we'll just simply punt. And, and, and by punting, I mean uh, using convertible to ventures. So, so it's, it's, we'll, we'll come in as a loan and then we'll convert to equity at some later stage when there are, when there are metrics to do valuation and then, and then uh, come in at a discount. Uh, it's, it's not always the preferred instrument for uh, uh, some angel investors because they do actually uh, recognize that there's significant risks when they come in at such an early stage and they would like to have the reward of some equity. That kind of leads into my next question, 
which is with unsophisticated investors, so friends, family, and fools, and then um, taking government loans from like, things like the CYBF. How do you view debt on the books? And then how do you view unsophisticated investors for equity, and then unsophisticated investors who may have convertible debt notes in the company? What are your attitudes towards both of those things? I don't think you really want As investors. I don't, as investors, fair enough. <laughs> like I've, I've heard that some investors don't like seeing debt on your books. For startup costs. Yeah, I don't think you would want unsophisticated investors on board to begin with. Yeah. Uh, that's my, my personal take is you're, you're going to be in a relationship with this person, so you probably want somebody who isn't going to screw with the vision of the company and is going to actually help you along the way. So I would just be very careful of, with the fool's category especially. Yeah. I think with all of those categories, it really depends what strings are attached to all of it. So, uh, uh, sometimes we're wary of uh, family investors. Because not only do you have them as perhaps unsophisticated investors, but also there are the emotional attachments to family money being in the company and uh, any sort of obligations that you might have in terms of the relationship with family members. So that makes it difficult for us. And, and we want to make sure that the uh, founders are getting sound business advice. Question? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so building a team is, is a real challenge in the early stages. You have an idea and a concept and you're the, the lead leader, shall we say. And I guess I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on particular uh, skills that have been used or techniques that have been used to try and bring people in to the team because you don't have the name, the moniker, the money, et cetera, but you have a vision and a dream. I was just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Communication skills are, are paramount here. Right? And, 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 that, and that's where we really sort of get to see the uh, founder shine if they have that ability to, to communicate well and to lead and to get other people excited behind his dream or her dream. But, but what if I can't afford it? What, what if I, at that early stage I haven't been able to, to put that star team together? Does that, does that count me out? I mean, how do, you, how do you do that as a VC then if you've I'm got, not quite there? You've got two things you can use, cash if you have it, equity if equity. you don't have the cash, and at the end of the day, you know, you've got to, you've got to convince Jack to take the magic beans if, uh, if that's what it's going to take, right? <laughs> so you, you've got to be, you know, if you're passionate, excited about what you're doing, fully committed yourself, a good storyteller can sell well. You know, we've got companies that have come into us that have had eight people working for nothing for a year, building stuff on the side, you know, they're working... 30 hours a week after their daytime job to, to help this person build to this vision because that person has just sold them on the idea that the, I'm going to change the world and you're coming along for the ride. I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, in those early days, I mean, the best case scenario is that you're recruiting people that you know. Um, when you're recruiting people that you're, you quote unquote hire or whether it's for cash or for equity, um, it's really not the same dynamic than if it's someone that you've known for you know five or ten years and you know you've worked together and you're gonna get through whatever you know, when when shit hits the fan you're gonna kind of stick together, um, and that's that's sort of uh, in some ways almost depressing because if if you don't know a good technical co-founder or something, um, that's very that's just kind of a real problem. Like there's no real good good way to get around that because you just it needs to be a network of friends that you've uh, you've worked with. Um, but beyond that, yeah, you definitely want to work. Uh, uh, you want the types of people that will come in for equity rather than uh, cash, because those are usually the people that are in it for the right reasons. Uh. Question. Thank you, panel, for really good information. Two questions. Uh, first one to Rami and to Mike. In your particular situations, the if I knew then what I do know now about going after funding. What would be the one thing that you've learned along the way that, gee, if I had only known this, things might be different in a more positive way? Yeah. <laughs> um, pass on all the hard ones first. So or two <laughs> things. Or two things, things or, yeah, yeah I mean, more rounds of oh. yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'll, first of all, I'll reiterate what I said uh, uh, before, that you really want to stagger your your pitches. Um, don't just go, and I totally made this mistake a bunch of times, don't just go out and do you know, 20 pitches in, in a week. What you really want to do is do a few, realize that you know, the way you was, you've been pitching it was totally wrong, iterate, and go do a few more, and, and so on and, and so forth. Um, and then really, in some ways, doing those pitches 
it doesn't just help you refine the pitch, it actually almost helps you refine the vision of the company, like what you're actually trying to do. So you almost learn, it's like a self-discovery experience. Generally like pitching very smart people. <laughs> yeah, right? that's right. They didn't, they so you didn't get, get in command of all this money by being dumb, so you're gonna learn a lot. Yeah, so you, you end up refining you know, what your company should be over that, uh, over that time, so that's a really good approach. Um, I'll say this, th this might be obvious, but you know, the only real way to get to investors is through introductions. Don't ever like submit your resume through uh, you know, the email uh, inbox that every investor has. It's almost like a trap door. Um, if, you <laughs> if you go through that email inbox, it's almost a guarantee that you, they'll never fund you, which is interesting because they all have that, you know, submit resume to us today, and that's, that's, you can't do that. You pretty much have to go through, uh, through introductions. Uh, so that uh, definitely hurt, uh, helps. Um, I'll say this for technical founders, there's a generally almost an aversion to networking and going to lots of networking events because 99% of them are tend to be useless. And it's, you know, it's true, 99% <laughs> tend to be useless. But the, you need to go to them because that 1% is what really makes all the difference. So networking is, is pretty important. And as a, for, for the technical co-founders, like it, that takes a while. It took me a while to realize uh, that, like the to kind of get randomness on your side by going to lots of these kinds of events to eventually uh, get some value out of it. Uh, uh, yeah, those are, I guess those are three pretty good things. Uh, I've been trying to think about more mistakes that I've made, but to, to be honest, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just an optimist, but I, I feel like every kind of mistake along the way has, has a positive light. There's a silver lining in them. I think the one thing I probably did earlier on that maybe hurt the development of the product a little bit and that my attention was focused on it was I, I basically pitched to everyone. Uh, and in hindsight, I probably should have qualified the people I was investing, I was pitching to a little bit more before putting the time into it. Because it does take time, ultimately. You're talking about uh, having to travel somewhere, have to dedicate a couple of hours, there's a follow-up. So you are talking about a significant chunk of your time. And you just want to make sure that before that, like I mentioned earlier, investors uh, invest in patterns. So it's highly recommended that you try to instead spend that upfront time identifying the people that are more likely to invest in you and maybe like Mike mentioned, try to use the, the guys who you think are unlikely as practice and then focus on the guys that you think are gonna be really good opportunities. So. And, and learn how to recognize a no. Pretty much anything except <laughs> here's a term sheet is a no. So learn to recognize <laughs> what a no looks like. There's, in the venture world, uh, there's all kinds of creative ways that people will say no to you. Um, uh, and you need to learn to recognize the different varieties. Pre pretty much most investors will give you either a very strong signal or an answer within a week or two at the most, um, and they'll keep the process moving. So if you don't see that, the then it's If the process stalls, it's a no. Yeah, the process stalls, yeah. it's a no. So that takes a little while to recognize as well, because in the early days, every, everyone's always positive. Everyone tells you how awesome you are. No one's going to you know, call you an idiot uh, uh, when you're, you know, you're pitching to them. But that's almost, uh, in some ways, a disservice because you don't like. It makes you think, "Oh, this is everyone loves me." When really, you know, you're you're not actually getting traction. <laughs> okay. Yep. Question. Uh, yeah. So uh, the two investors, they okay. There we go. The two investors they mentioned a lot. They focus a lot on the roles of a CEO, a good leader. Um, we have two CEOs here. I just want to ask. In the early stages of your company, how did you divide up your time as a leader of your company? So how did you divide the time? I beg your pardon? How yes, you, how, did, how, did, you how did you allocate your time and energy in early stages as a CEO of a company? Yeah. If you go way back, it's probably building a prototype. And uh, when did that, like when did when did you start, you know, like we have a solid pro prototype, you probably have a couple guys working with you, so did you leave yeah. them alone and then start going for like, yeah. start going to the market? I am, yeah, I'm trying to figure out the best way to answer this question. I, I think, at least for me personally, I, I've always found that the role ended up being uh, whatever there is a hole, you fill it. So I, I've literally done everything from get toilet paper to like, code and pitch in front of investors. So there's really no specific time allocation in the early stages. You're just gonna have to do everything. Like, that's a reality. Whatever you see a hole or a weakness in the team, you're gonna need to fill it. I think the, the thing that helps a lot is, it's important to, to be a good CEO, whatever that means. I'm still trying to figure that out. But 
uh, I think getting co-founders in early is absolutely crucial. Like, uh, that's probably the one thing that I, I say has definitively helped us get to where we are now. So you, you want to make sure that you have the right people on board earlier. And uh, whether they're friends or not, if you don't have the friends that are good fit, go out there and make some. Like, there's a ton of meetups out there. If you don't have a CTO, then go out there, meet a lot of people. Take some interest in technical matters, uh, learn a bit about code, try to mesh, bond, and then afterwards see if you can do something. You know, it might take a year or two of doing that, but it's worthwhile investment. Yeah, there's one thing I'm going to add, and, and again, we're running short on time, but it's, it's just something that when we look at investments, and I think the other people would agree here as well, and that you, you really have to also focus on that go to market. There's a lot of great technology. Uh, that comes out here, and, and people are in love with the technology, and there's great technology coming out of Canada. I think it's the best in the world. Where we, where we lack a little bit is that go-to-market, where you need to go out there and, and get out there early, fast, and just as you're reiterating and trying things with mm -hmm. the VCs, and you're trying things in your different market, I think you gotta try that in the marketplace as well, and get out there. I, I, think, yeah, I don't know if you guys absolutely. would agree with that. but yeah. I would say the most useful thing, the single most useful thing you can do in really actually any stage, is talk to customers. Talk to tons yeah. and tons of customers. Never stop doing that. Like almost as a fixed 20% of your time at mm -hmm. minimum should be spent talking to customers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. My, uh, my question is, um, in the venture I'm currently involved in, we have our own SMD equipment. We can make our own boards and robots and whatnot. So we're hoping to avoid the standard um, path described in general for venture capital completely. But one thing really interests me, and I've asked about it, and I never, if you think this is out of the scope, that's fine. I'm trying to find out if there's such a way to combine old-fashioned factoring of invoice receivables with offering equity. So that, so that with customers like Time Warner and Verizon, will be Google Fiber, that you can accept a substantial order and disregard some of the numeracy, the, the internal issues, and offer equity and make an exit plan specifically so that you can use a VC to do that corner of the operation. I've never heard of anybody really doing that, but can you sell your accounts receivable? Can, can I ask, ask, answer this? Yeah, please do. Uh, you haven't seen anybody doing it because in the early stage technology companies, it's a luxury of having the receivables. So, so <laughs> if, if you have the receivables, yes, there are. I mean, there are people, um, there are private sector, there are private, uh, actually angel investors, there are groups that would do that. I, I, I uh, you know, I would think there's a, there's, a, there's a group, Expresso Capital would be an example that does shred credits. In other words, they loan against SR&ED. Um, and they, they would also, I'm sure, if you had receivables from a, uh, um, a major corporation like you're talking about, that they would figure out creative ways to help finance that. So there yeah, are I people mean, that would a, do that. A number Is of that our fair? companies have AR financing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it's not from a venture firm, it's from a, a venture bank. Yeah. Like yeah. Silicon Valley, Valley, Valley Bank or someone and, like that. And, um, yeah. uh, Comerica Bank. I mean, anybody would, you know, there are people that would take a look at that. And often they do take a little, little tiny piece yeah. of equity that in the deal. Be, yeah. Yeah, question. Are we done? Yes, we're just about out of time. Okay, so you just shut us down whenever you need to do that. Uh, one last question. Sure. I'm just wondering, um, if you're at the early stage and working on your MVP and you're trying to bootstrap your operation, at what stage should you start talking to investors or the uh, angel market? Like, I, I get a lot of advice that, you know, if you can hold off as long as possible, hold off as long as possible. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like there's also good knowledge there and just applying to the process whether you end up with the term sheet or not. So I'm just wondering at, if you guys could kind of speak to that. Should you, you know, engage that, uh, that group right away or just wait as long as you can um, and you know, get as many uh, customers or early adopters? Or would you, you know, go into I, this? I would say that there's no point in waiting. I, I, I don't see what's to be gained by sort of hanging back and, 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 and trying to develop a very complete prototype before you begin talking. You know, we're really sort of not at the negotiation stage here. Right. If you can get early access to, to some investors, they'll probably give you some, some very valuable insight that right. might not have occurred to you. Right. And I'll just finish it up then, because I think we're running over time. And, and they'll track with you. So you know, we're, we're, we're looking at an investment where we've probably been working with this company for two years. They've been able to, uh, to get uh, non-dilutive financing from grants, and, and they got, they've received advances from some of their clients and customers. And they've continued to develop their business. But now they have a bunch of venture capitalists around them right. who are going, wow, we're there. So 
it's never too early because okay. you just build a relationship. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So I want to thank uh, the panel. I want to thank you guys a lot. I've always I always enjoy doing this, and I like the fact that I, we get a chance to hear from both the the VCs and the entrepreneurs. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for participating in this. I want to. Thank the audience. Um, again, some very good questions, and we should probably open up even earlier to the audience to get to see what you're looking for. And thank you very much for coming tonight, and uh, I'm sure some of us are up here to answer some more questions if you have them. Thank you very much.